Um, today is uh, September 25th, 2019, and I'm uh, I, Keith Crudgington, and I'm here with Sydney Tynan uh, at her house on 30 Tompkins Lane uh, to talk with her about her life and her time in Little Compton for the Historical Society's um, forthcoming project on Little Compton women. Um, so, Sydney, yes. if you could begin by telling me just your details of when you were born and where and um, the short biography of your life to mm -hmm. get you to Little Compton. Okay. Well, I was born at the Lying In Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, it's now called, I believe, the Phillips House, but anyhow, um, as I was trying to get out of my mother, my father was trying to push my mother in a wheelchair um, and he didn't put the brakes on and it kept sliding away from him and there he was with me trying to get out and my mother screaming and my father chasing the chair down the, the corridors. So that was an interesting way to begin. <laughs> and what year would that be? That would have been 1921. Um, uh, I was very lucky in my father. Never for a second did I ever get the feeling that he had wished I were a boy. Whereas my mother, who was a plantation girl from South Carolina, longed for a boy. Girls weren't considered much down there. And she was waiting and waiting and waiting. She had to wait six years for the boy. So anyhow, I had a very happy life with my dad. He was left-handed. He um, was not a banker or a stockbroker or any of the things that his friends were. He had a small manufacturing a plant in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he made flower pots. And as time went on, he made plastic flower pots, and he invented the hanging pot. And he was, for a while, the largest manufacturer of plastic pots in the world. So anyhow, we lived in my grandmother's beautiful house on Bay State Road during the week. But on weekends, as soon as school was out, and I went to first Little Beaver and then Big Beaver, then the Depression hit, and we moved into my grandmother's tiny little house in Top Boxford, Topsfield, Massachusetts. Then we moved back into town and I went to Windsor School. And always on weekends, we went down to the country because that was where my father was happiest and knew everything. And we would chop paths in the winter. And um, it didn't matter how cold it was. I remember it would get to be 30 degrees below at times. And the insides of our noses would freeze and before we were allowed to have an axe, and he had little axes made by a special axe man, we used what we call spoke shaves. I believe they're also called draw knives, but we would hack away at little trees, little saplings, until we got, got those down. The area now has paths that we established, and they're used by walkers and um, horse riders, and it's called the Lockwood Forest. So you could go there and see where I roamed as a little girl. The paths you made. Yes, yes. So I enjoyed school. Um, I had a wonderful education. My father felt that, that was all important. My friends had jangly gold bracelets and cashmere sweaters, and my clothes came from Jordan Marsh basement. Um, and I did mind that a little, but I can see now that probably a private school education was something of a difficulty 
uh, for a man who was making flower pots. Um, anyhow, I, I did well in school, and I think it was equivalent to what is a freshman year in college now. So another thing that I remember about being in Boston, once in a great horrible while there'd be a wedding or there'd be something that would mean that we had to stay in Boston for the weekend. Oh, and on Saturday lunch, almost always if we were in Boston, we would have Finn and Hattie, which is a kind of a yellow smoke um, haddock, maybe, and my grandmother, who owned the house, gave it over to my mother to run. Um, we had a cook in the kitchen, and a laundress, and a chambermaid who was also the waitress, and of course, a nurse, a nanny. Um, my mother being from the South, didn't know how to cook. Um, and although there were always um, African-American hands to do things, they had no money, no money on those old plantations. So I, th I think she felt very comfortable. She, um, was fun and pretty and um, had a lot of friends and loved gossip. They call, her name was Caroline Sidney and she, her nickname was Carrie, so they called her Carrie the News. Had she, had she come from South Carolina? <laughs> yes, she did, yes. Came down from a rundown old plantation in South Carolina. Well, so no. did, had Carrie the News come from South Carolina? Well, her name was Caroline right. Sidney. Oh, your mother? Yes, my yeah. Yeah, yeah, she was Caroline Sidney. Ah. And they ran out of, of Carrie's, Carrie, Cad. So they decided, ah. no, they decided to call me Car um, Sidney. So that's how I got to be Sidney. But that is another whole story which I won't go into. So I graduated from um, what was then Miss Windsor's. I w was very nearsighted, um, so I never was any good at sports at all. I did modern dance and I tried archery and none of those things worked out very well. Um, but I always wrote. I was the editor of our senior um, magazine and I still have a copy. Um, and then I went to Bryn Mawr. My Orig the original Caroline Sidney Sinclair um, had a lovely house outside of Philadelphia and a beautiful big house near Rittenhouse Square that she owned with her sister. The story of these two penniless South Carolina women and how they got to be <laughs> millionaires is something else again. I wish sometimes that I could write a novel about them because it's pretty darn interesting. So anyhow, I went to Bryn Mawr and sometimes I, the chauffeur came in and picked me up and took me out to the Highlands, which is now um, a, an event place. And sometimes I went to her lovely house in 1604 Locust Street near Rittenhouse Square. Um, after a year, the war was looming. So I was married in 1940. And it wasn't too long after that that my husband went into the Navy. Um, we lived in Cambridge for a year, and then, then we moved on to Washington, D.C., to Chevy Chase. My very elegant, extremely rich parents-in-law 
thought that we all belonged to the Chevy Chase Club. It never occurred to them that we had absolutely zero money for a babysitter. So we, and I didn't have the clothes, you know? Um, I didn't know anything about getting dressed up because I never had. So we lived there for several years. Um, he went to Germany before the war was ended uh, with what was it, Office of Strategic OSS, yes, and learned how to kill somebody with a matchbox and had his hair all shorn. Um, and while he was away, my first son was born, and then we moved to Darlington, Maryland, um, because he was attached to the Aberdeen Proving Ground as an aeronautical engineer. And um, before we moved, my second son was born in a brand new hospital in Bethesda, Maryland. And he was the, at that time, he was the longest child to have been born in that hospital. Then we moved to Darlington, Maryland, because my husband was um, at the Aberdeen Proving Ground. And we lived there for quite a few years. Um, my third and fourth children were born in the little local hospital in Habit of Grace, as they call it. And when my third son was ready to go to school, I helped get a school started, Harvard Day School. The other two children had been able to go to what had been a small, very good private school which had been taken over by the state. So they had a good beginning, but then I was told that I could no longer put my two younger children in that school because I didn't live in that town. So that was that. I wasn't going to have them go to the huge, great, big public school. We started a school which has done remarkably well. It's huge now. What's um, its name? It's Harford Day School because we lived in Harford, not Hartford, Harford, Day, Harford County. So after, after the school was started, my husband was assigned to a, um, to a post um, in Washington, D.C. Um, and he was responsible for choosing the helicopters that the, that the Navy and the Army were to have. And my children, my two youngest, went to Georgetown Day School. Um, then, hmm, let's see, then we were divorced. And meantime, we had been sailing every weekend on the Chesapeake Bay, which was quite a feat when you have four small children and you have to pack all the food up on Fridays because in those days there weren't gimbal stoves and there weren't generators for refrigerators. And um, so my, my weekends were filled. Um, I worked at the school um, as the games mistress. I also bought apples for the snack time because we could only pay the teachers from 8.30 to 1 o'clock. So the children all had um, milk and milk and apples or milk and cookies. And to save money, I remember, I used to buy the long straws and cut them in half. So the school was a lot of fun. Um, I was kind of the 
person at the tail end. First was the, the, the wonderful woman with the silver trumpets um, and lo who had big pockets. And so she, she was extremely helpful in, in funding things. Then came the wonderful, wise headmistress. And then came me with the dustpan and brush kind of sweeping up the, sweeping up the remains. So anyhow, that was a very interesting and wonderful time in my life. Um, I loved my friends and I loved seeing something work. Every year we added another grade and moved the bookcases around. Don't pay any attention to that. Um, it's, I have very few commercial calls anymore, but that may be one of them. So anyhow, Time went by, and I remarried and moved to India, which was very, very interesting. Um, I took my two younger children with me. They went to the international school, and one of them could have gone to a, a very good school run by Jesuits. We're not Catholic, but the Jesuits did a wonderful job of teaching children how to think. And it wasn't until about a year after that that we made some very good Jesuit friends who were priests. And they said, oh, if we'd only known, you know. But I couldn't have one child in one school and another in another. It didn't, it didn't work. So we came back to the States, of course, on home leave and decided that we would move into Little Compton because it was too far away from Cambridge to be expected at his father's house for Friday night and a hundred miles away from Boxford so we couldn't be expected for Sunday lunch. And after a while my, my husband moved out and I started for the summers, the um, Little Compton Art Association. I had. What a, year would this have been? I don't remember. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. um, I. I um, had an artist in residence who lived in the house. We had classes in the morning. At your house. I'm sorry. Was it at your house? At my house, which was the house on the rock next to the golf course. On Sakonic Point Road. Yes, yep, on Sakonic Point. Um, because when I had been living in Washington, D.C., I had taken training at a school that was the first to recognize dyslexia as something that could be helped, and that children who were dyslectic were not stupid or lazy. And so when I came back, when I came to Little Compton, um, my husband, who was an alcoholic, um, was at home and I couldn't be too far away. So I worked as a teacher's aide at Josephine Wilbur for a number of years. Um, I did some work for the special ed teacher. Um, I did corrected math papers, you know, whatever a teacher's aide had to do. And that was, that was really interesting. I also had a chance, um, when I wasn't a teacher's aide, uh, this was Lockie, who may come down as one of our, our wonderful women, um, got me a job, um, pro bono in a Catholic school, and that was an eye-opener. Um, I worked pro bono with, with two children. I always enjoyed doing that because you can see the results. And it's so heartening for a child to begin to realize that they are worth something. So I think that, that has always been um, a reward. Yes. How many years were you a teacher's aide at Wilbur McMahon, or Josephine Wilbur School? Uh, I really don't remember. 
my husband had left at that point, so it wasn't that important for me to be close to home. And I had a chance to go on a, a large sailing boat with a friend of my mother's who was an ornithologist. And we went, we were down in the Caribbean and did snorkeling and bird watching. And that was the end of my my time. Then, I don't quite know why I thought I could do it, but I've always been a reader. And so I started a little bookstore at Tiberton Four Corners because they were redoing the old Mill, mill Pond um, house. And so when I told people that I, I can remember going to a cocktail party and telling people that I was going to start a bookstore. And I felt at that moment as though there was going to be a big hole in the ground and I was going to sink right down into it. Anyhow, it was a great success. Um, what was it, it called? It was called Books from Four Corners, which is a double, double meaning, yes. Um, and I had a good friend then, a lawyer, Richard Diderio, who lived in, in, in Tiverton, and he said to me that he knew that it was going to be a success. And that taught me to say things to people, to encourage them or tell them they had done something well. It's extremely important you never can tell how that will light up a person. So that was a lesson, you know, that I've kept kept with About what with year me. would you say you started uh, Books from Four Corners? Oh, let's say 20 years ago. It was about the same time that I sold my house and lived in Adamsville and started building this one. This is the first, I've had it, I've been in Little Compton 42 years. From today? 43, yeah, mm -hmm. maybe 43. Um, and I've been in this house 33 years. And you built this house? I built this house, yes. Um, and it was wonderful because I didn't have anybody else telling me what I should or shouldn't do. This house is exactly what I wanted. And I was very lucky in getting the land. I got four acres on a distress sale for $25,000. And having been brought up in the countryside in Boxford, Topsfield, we were right on the, on the line. Um, this place has evolved um, as I have wanted it to. Um, and I feel, I feel very, very lucky to be able to live out my last days in a place that is this beautiful. Um, it probably will sell for, I don't, maybe, maybe a million by then. Mm -hmm. I imagine that the house, which is very idiosyncratic, will probably be torn down. Mm -hmm. I hope that the paths and the gardens, such as they are, because I've had to give up a lot of them, um, but that's all right. I can't, with my cane, I can't even deadhead anymore. But that's all right. I think that you have to be comfortable with change as you get older. There's no point in regretting because that's bad for the spirit. So I'm very lucky in having all kinds of people to help me. I have a wonderful gardening woman who has a team and she knows just what to do. We have a, we, we walk around and I say this and this and this and she knows just what to do. So here I am. Did you lay out all of the gardens? I'm sorry? Did you lay out and create all of the gardens over time? Um, 
I had a great deal of help from Martha Paul, who was a landscape designer, not an architect. And she knew just what I wanted. Um, I had seen one woman, and I said, I want this place to look as though it had evolved. And she wanted me to cut down all the trees on the edge and plant a double row of hawthorns. I thought, I don't think that that woman paid any attention to me. Then the next person that came along, and I can't remember his name, but he was the head horticulturalist for the um, Providence Zoo. I'm sure that somebody else will remember the name. And he came to me and said he wanted to do it. And I thought, if he does it, it's going to be what he wants, and he's not going to pay a piece of attention to me. So Martha and I worked on this. Um, I can remember, um, it's been written up for the Historical Society, but my little walled garden was the Tompkins burial ground. And when I started work on it, Martha said, I only give you as much work to do as I think you can do in a season. So that was the year that I had to take Sunday New York Times and wet it and put it down on the weeds and then cover it with straw, not hay, straw, so that it, the paper wouldn't dry up and, and blow away. And then I was very, very lucky. I had some Nabisco stock, which split. And I took the split and gave it to Michael Jaguer, who was then only 25. And he built the wall all the way around because the footprint was there for the, where the little cemetery had been. And then he made, he made the walls, the stone walls. And so they have lasted just beautifully. He's, that must have been 25, at least 25, 30 years ago. So the place is not just how I imagined it, it's how people have, have helped me. When did you start writing uh, your letters to the Sakonet Times? Well, I had been writing them to a group of friends. And then somebody said, why don't you try sending one to the Sakonet Times? And Bruce was so sweet. He said, your letters make my day. Bruce? Burdock. Uh, um, Burden. Whatever the the, the oh, yeah yes he's mm -hmm. the he's the editor yes 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 so I tell you having had a husband my first husband who told me that I was a mine of misinformation who never told me I looked pretty or had done anything right having people come up to me on the street to say I just want to tell you you know it's 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 been wonderful. You know, I have a huge ego now. How often do you write them? Once a month. And the, the sentences kind of pile up in my head. It takes an extraordinary amount of energy. Yeah. I can't believe it. Um, so finally, I say, I can't stand this build up anymore. And I've got to sit down and write it. And I'm so glad I have the computer because I can change things. Whereas if I was writing it by hand or on a typewriter, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. So I'm delighted with my reading public. And somehow or other, there always seems to be something to say. Tell me how you first came to Little Compton. How did you discover uh, Little That is a really long story. <laughs> okay. My Tynan husband was Catholic. Um, and he was very much in love with a beautiful blonde with brown eyes who was a Congregationalist. He had met her somewhere down here. And so the families didn't approve of that at all. Either family, no, would not do. So 
many years later, my second son was in Ohio, at Ohio State getting his doctorate. And he remembered that this beautiful lady had married and was living in Columbus, Ohio. And he wrote to the college that she had gone to in um, Connecticut, Conn College, and got her address and wrote to her and said, this is not the relationship that I had envisaged, but would you be nice to my stepson? So she was, one, they were wonderful to my young panelists uh, son and, and daughter-in-law. When they couldn't afford to come east for Thanksgiving, they had them or whatever, they really couldn't have been nicer. So my Tynan husband decided that he would take his GI Bill of Rights and write the Naval History of the Knights of Malta. He was in the Supply Corps in the Navy. Um, and so he was interested in the, how the supplies went. So he took his GI Bill of Rights and we moved to Rome. And while we were in Rome, she wrote to him and said, I'm coming to Rome with three friends because unlike me who was happier traveling on my own, she was like a lemming, you know. She had to have a group with her. So she arrived in Rome with her friends and he took her to here and he took her to there. And she said, when you come back for um, home leave, or, or when you come back in the summer for leave, um, why don't you try, see if you like Little Compton? So that was when we discovered it would be perfect because it protected us from our families. So that's how I came to Little Compton. And, and why did you stay? Why did I stay? Well, because I was part of the school, you know. Um, I had, Chloe Binger was a wonderful friend, and so was Betts Woodhouse. And being married to an alcoholic is, is, is difficult. Um, but I did have some friends. Juanita Walker was a big help. She helped me get the school, the, the bookstore started, and still is a close friend. Um, and I stayed because it became my town. So you immediately fell in with a group of the, the artistic community, it sounds like. Yes. Yes, so, I, I did, yeah. And who were they? I mean, that's Well, at and... that time, there was Patty Zimmer, uh -huh. who I, I cooked supper for them every Sunday night. Um, I didn't have a lot of friends, but Betts was, was a big help. <laughs> I'll have to tell you, because I'm sure she'll be in the... But this is such a great story. My alcoholic husband, of course, was paranoid. And Betts had invited me down to meet Hillary's wife, Helen. And so I went down, and pretty soon, along comes Jack Tynan, red in the face, and absolutely positive that I was having an assignation with uh, a man. And when that got cleared up and he left, Betts looked at me and said in her little high voice, get rid of him. <laughs> and so I did. <laughs> That's a sculpture of Betts Woodhouse? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So at one point I was the chairman, oh. no, I was the chairman for the tree committee. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for a couple of years, and I met some really great people through that. Um, what kind of work did the tree committee do? It
one of the things it one of the things it does is to give plants to children to a certain grade in school, elementary school. Um, another thing they do is to keep an eye on trees that need pruning. Um, the town does have a tree warden, but they can't always afford to, to do all the pruning that needs to be done. So the tree committee uh, is is uh, funded only by private donation. It's not it's not um, paid for by the town. Um, we just kept an eye on things, you know, um, and I I feel very strongly about trees and growing things. You know, I've been a gardener since I was seven, um, except when I lived in India, and then the gar gardener would come along and dig up anything that I'd planted and replant it. Yes. <laughs> I can remember planting sweet peas, and then he came along and dug them all up and replanted them. <laughs> Which is your favorite garden in your little Compton time? Well, you know, that's a really difficult question. I'm extremely fond of John Gwynn, mm -hmm. and it is a real treat for me to be able to take friends to see his gardens. But he is so diametrically different from what I want that I can't say that I really have a favorite garden. I did do the Little Compton uh, Garden Club trip a couple of years ago when they raised such an extraordinary amount of money. Um, I guess Joya Brown's is my favorite. I particularly like the rock garden, and of course Lloyd Lawton's st stonework is, is always a marvel that a man with so little training could imagine and make such beautiful things with stones. It just goes to show you can't just judge somebody until you know what they can do. So we can wind up if um, you're getting tired, but, but do, just overall, how has Little Compton changed since you first arrived? Well, I think the only thing that is really upsetting is the vineyard. I don't think it's changed except for that. The creation of the vineyard? No, no. What's oh. going on in the vineyard? Oh. Yes. Yeah. You know, I don't think it's it's it hasn't changed that much. The food at the commons is still inedible. <laughs> Um, do you have any um, more stories from the Art Association, from the, your years starting the Little Compton Art Association? I remember I had, I had the boyfriend of a friend um, as our artist, and he brought a dead goldfish for the children, uh, no, goldfinch, uh, for the children to, to, um, to paint. And some of them were horrified to see something dead. Mm -hmm. What was the work of the Little Compton Art Association? That was just what I did, you know. But what did it do? It was for school children. Uh, we had children. We had a class for children. We had a class for adults. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Yeah. And um, do you have any stories from your uh, Josephine uh, Wilbur? 
school aids. <laughs> yeah. uh, there were some remarkable teachers, mm -hmm. some really remarkable teachers, and I caught up with the news of some of them not too long ago, and one of them has become a quilter, a beautiful quilter. <laughs> yeah. Um, no. Um, is there anything I haven't asked you about? that you think is important? I think um, having an animal is really important. Um, I grew up with animals. And then, of course, this is something that nobody will believe. Um, we had a pet otter. They were raised by, by permission uh, to be retrievers in Mill, Minnesota by Mr. Emil Lear. And my father heard about it and got a baby as we were in New York City on our way to my mother's plantation, which we did every Easter. And we had this baby otter um, who was, it was, it was uh, by permit, you know, he, he raised them to be retrievers, yes. So I grew up, I know, I was 12 when the Depression um, put us in my grandmother's little house um, in Boxford Topsfield, and I went to what is now the North Shore Country Day. So we had, we had, I guess that was the second year. The first year we had a raccoon who lived in the house and lived in my, my parents' bed until she bit the hot water bottle and my mother said, that's enough. She can't sleep in the bed with us anymore. So my, my grandmother had a great big kind of black Labrador type and one night both the raccoon and, because she was never paying, paid, penned, um, one night, both the, the dog and the raccoon were outside and decided they wanted to come in. And in the morning, we came downstairs and the house was roaring hot. She had climbed up on the dog's back and with her clever little hand, she had pulled down on the latch. And so they were able to get in. So that was, of course, in the winter. And the winters were very severe in those days. So at some time in the spring, she left. And my dad said, she's going off to have her own family now. And so it was the following year. I think, is there a picture of me with the, with the otter in here? Yeah. Um, where did the otter live? Don't they need water? Well, um, yes, we would call her after we'd had a bath and she'd come and get in the bath. Um, but they don't have to have water. And when we had her in the Boston house, when we moved back, she had a great big sandbox that she used like a cat. That's my dad. That's the drawing I did of her. She was named after the person that my dad went courting when he saw my mother instead in South Carolina. There's no picture of me with it. No. Well, it would have been in there, in, in that section. Yeah. Wonderful. And what was Tompkins Lane like when you first moved here? much the same except for this house here and this broke my heart. Um, I had a friend who was interested in buying the property um, if it ever came on the market. It came on the market and he wasn't told and then I it would have put a debt in me but it would have added 500,000. I was really sad about that. It's
but at least it doesn't have teenagers blasting music at, at, at all times. So I just kind of turn away from that. Is there anything else about the um, bookstore that we haven't talked about? Um, well, of course, Amazon.com killed it, but it was fun having it. Um, people enjoyed it. It was a nice little country bookstore. It had a very, very good children's section. It had a small um, out-of-print historical section. Um, New and old books? I had a few out-of-print books, mm -hmm. a few. And I didn't have hard covers because at that time the Stop and Shop was selling hardcover, uh, you know, top of the line um, books for twenty or twenty or thirty percent off. There wasn't any point in my carrying hardcovers, so it was mostly what they call trade paperbacks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had nonfiction and fiction. And I was pretty fussy about the fiction that I had. Did you sell used books? Um, if they were, I, I don't like to call them used books. They were out of print books, uh -huh. OK? Um, on Little Compton, Tiverton history. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because there were a few that were hard to find or hard right. to get. Yeah. 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 So it was it was a pleasant time. I made good friends with the other people in the in the building. And a long time friend was Margaret McNaren who took over the pottery store. And she comes every summer and spends two weeks. So what do you like about Little Compton? I like the fact that people are are friendly and pretty honest mm? and truth, truthful, you know. I grew up with a mother who would say, oh, well, let's talk about the roses and, and avoided anything that was un, unpleasant. Um, I feel that as a community, we understand each other and we don't lie to each other and that people are as i get really old people are so willing to help me or open doors or carry packages or do things for me um, which i don't think you'd find so much say in a busy new jersey town I mean, we're only 3,000 people. And, of course, the air, I believe, truly, has contributed to my longevity, because it's clean. Well, and it gr things grow. Yes, yeah, and, and the trees and the oxygen, yes. So I just feel very lucky to have landed here and I feel it's my town, my town, and um, because of stay at home in Little Compton, I don't ever have to move out. My executor's son knows that. so. I'm, I'm in good shape. And so we can bring it to a close if you have any f last thoughts. No, I, I, I really don't. Just that I'm, well, lucky. I'm lucky. Well, and we're lucky. I'm lucky, yes. Yeah. So um, is, do you want a picture to go with?